Welcome to Mind Love, episode 25. Today's episode is all about self-worth, body boundaries, and faking orgasms. This concept of performance, I mean, when we're in ego, when we're in fear, we're performing so that people don't truly see our authentic self. Turn up your frequency with Mind Love. Bite-sized brain hacks for seekers, dreamers, and doers. It's time to give your mind a little love with your host, Melissa Monti. Hey, friends. First off, Mind Love is now a CastBox original. CastBox is the fastest-growing, highest-rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, where you can get all of your favorite podcasts. It has a super clean layout, and you can create playlists and download episodes to play offline. It's my personal favorite and where I listen to all of my podcasts. Don't worry, you can still listen to Mind Love wherever you get your podcasts, but I hope you'll give CastBox a try. So today we're going deep, and I just want to give you some fair warning that we're talking about some topics that you may not be comfortable playing around young children. With that out of the way, we have a super powerful discussion coming up. Today, we're talking to fashion icon, author, and activist, Carrie Otis. Carrie spent most of her life in the spotlight. She was one of the most recognizable faces in the modeling industry in the 80s and 90s. For some of my more age-mature listeners, you may remember tabloids of her tumultuous and abusive marriage to Mickey Rourke. Despite being a beautiful, famous supermodel married to a rich and famous man, her life was really spiraling out of control behind the scenes. She was suffering from severe anorexia, various addictions, sexual assault, and heavy domestic abuse. It goes to show you, never judge a book by its cover. It's so easy to look at people on TV or on social media and pine over their picture-perfect lives, but what you see is not always what you get, and that might not be the reality at all. Carrie published her memoir, Beauty Disrupted, in 2011, and after years of recovery through spiritual and personal work, she's now a voice for change for those in need. Today, three key things we will learn are body boundaries and how to create them, why faking orgasms destroys intimacy and self-worth, and how to cultivate self-love in ourselves and in the next generation. Before we dive in, I want to invite you to sign up for the Morning Mind Love. You'll get short daily reminders of your own beauty, worth, and power so you can start each day with a positive mindset and keep your vibes up between episodes. To sign up, visit mindlove.com and sign up right there on the homepage. You'll get some amazing free gifts when you do. First, you'll get our exclusive Powerless booklet, which is an awesome free booklet based on proven principles from the most successful people and some of our favorite guests. Plus, you'll get a free guided affirmation meditation set at the Miracle Tone, which is known to help attract love, health, and abundance into your life. The layered affirmations perfectly tune your frequency for personal transformation. So be sure to head to mindlove.com to sign up. Or if you're out and about, just text the word MORNING to 444-999. That's MORNING to 444-999. Audiobooks are my favorite way to step up my personal growth without taking time out of my busy day. Audible includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, including all of my favorites and every single book we've ever mentioned on Mind Love, like Think and Grow Rich, Psycho Cybernetics, The Four Agreements, seriously, all of them. Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook in their store, regardless of price, and unused credits roll over to the next month. If you don't like a book, you just exchange it, no questions asked. Plus, your books are yours to keep so you can go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. I use Audible every single day, and now you can join me because Audible is offering Mind Love listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audible.com slash mind or text mind to 500-500 to get your free book today. And now let's welcome Carrie Otis Sutton to the show. I'm thrilled. Thanks for having me. To start out, give us a little background on your life growing up. My life growing up was challenging. I was born in 68. And so the 70s, I look at it as it was this era of as long as everything looked okay, let's not talk about it. So there was just a lot of 
hidden aspects about the dysfunction that was within my family structure. And my parents were both wounded and unhappy at the time. So I grew up with, I'd say, a lot of disconnect and and darkness and real issues that I saw, but that were never discussed. And it wasn't like now where, you know, people are resourced and you go to therapy and your kids can be in play therapy and and it's okay. Like, it's good. We're, we're promoting that. So that's wonderful, but it was not like that. Um, when I was growing up, I was really neglected. Um, grew up with an alcoholic father and a depressed mother. And I really look at some of the challenges that have been some of the biggest gifts in my life is I grew up with a mother who was really disconnected from her femininity and from her sexuality. And there was a lot of shame and body shame. And so that was really my norm. So I moved through really, you know, profoundly developmental years with a lack of a role model of the empowered, embodied, sacred feminine. Um, So that was something I really, you know, part of my journey and where I'm at today. And I think sort of the activism and advocacy that I engage in today is really informed by my experiences in my childhood or or lack of sort of the lack of connection. When you were in your teens, you went into the modeling industry. What was your experience with the sexual harassment that you faced? And how did growing up play into the results of that? For me, growing up, I was not empowered or taught ever that I could say no about anything. I don't remember being told I couldn't say no. It was just I was never initiated into you, like my daughters, they have body boundaries, they have body awareness, they, I've just empowered them. You say no, you check in with your gut. So I was never initiated into that wellness of connection with myself. And, you know, as a result, there was just massive disconnect for me. So, I mean, it was kind of the perfect storm, right? I mean, you take a kid that's grown up like that with no boundaries, um, no um, really healthy sense of self um, and wants and needs and no way to voice them. And then put that individual into an industry that's based on, you know, promoting um, objectification, premature sexualization. You know, you can go down the list of boundary crossing that is just inherent in that industry. So I got into that industry already really wounded sexually because I'd already been sexually abused by another kid. And then also without those boundaries and into an industry that's focused on the physical body, not, you know, who you are as a spiritual being or as an individual. And it was really rough. And the saddest thing is it was completely normal and and unquestioned in my mind, the level of objectification and sexualization that I experienced both from sexual harassment. I mean, we didn't know that word then, right? I mean, it was just something you endured while on set with your agents, with bookers, with the way people talked about you. Um, So there was sexual harassment and then there was sexual assault. And it was a pretty common and consistent situation to be in to have to thwart off sexual advances from clients. And then there was really no mentors or no no one to go to with that information. Like, oh my gosh, this happened on a shoot. Is it okay? Is it normal? Where can I go? How can I get it to stop? There are wonderful organizations in place. This still have we have a t- long way to go, but the Model Alliance has fought for the rights of models within New York State so that there's actually a place to report sexual harassment, but that's only in one state that we actually have laws passed. And if you look at this as an industry that's working with our most vulnerable sector, which is our youth, you know, and young adults, it's a recipe for disaster and it's normalized. So it was very rough for me going through my upbringing and then moving into that industry. And I really had to work diligently once I hit my bottom to restructure and recreate and heal my own wounds, you know, moving forward and also create boundaries for myself in my life, which thankfully are completely intact today. But I lived the majority of my life without them being intact, which I think a lot of individuals can relate to. With all of that going on at such a young age and without the tools to handle it, how did that affect you? 
it affected me in a, a whole litany of ways, some of which were anorexia. You know, anorexia was for me a tool to manage the disarray, the upset, the chaos that was in my world, both externally and internally. It was a way, it was like a medication, you know, like, okay, everything is completely out of my control. The one thing I can control is what I put into my body. And, you know, hand in hand, that also was beneficial for my actual job. You know, you weren't going to get jobs unless you were a size double zero. So that was a behavior that I actually was paid for, as sad as that sounds. And it also manifested in a very severe disconnect. So a disconnect from myself and my sexuality, it was almost like something would happen to me and a whole trigger of events or a whole trigger of emotions would take place. And it would literally, like when I really was in intensive therapy, I would realize something would happen. And two weeks later, I would realize, wow, all this behavior has been triggered by an event that happened two weeks ago that I couldn't even say, wow, that really sucked. You just said something so offensive and inappropriate to me. And instead of being able to like nail it in the moment, two weeks later, I'd be like, I would have to think what happened? Like, how did I all of a sudden go back down this road again? So it created the events that happened, created a big disconnect with self, which also kept me from protecting myself. It kept me from having active boundaries. It kept me from being able to be intimate, sexually intimate, feeling safe enough to have an orgasm. And it also manifested in all sorts of other physical disorders that were byproducts of anorexia. You know, one was like drug addiction. Okay, I'm going to manage all of this chaos and upset and offenses that keep happening and I don't know how to protect myself. So I'm going to do drugs to further medicate the upset that's happening within my own soul. And then, you know, moving down the road, it manifested at 30, having to have heart surgery because of all of those behaviors. So for me, these things manifested from subtle to hit me over the head and knock me on my ass. And I'm fortunate, you know, I was able to have just the right combination, like the shit's hitting the fan and I'm going to have to look at this and make some massive changes or else I'm not going to be here. So I feel blessed that I did have this sort of perfect storm of events that brought me to a point where I had to take a look and then dig deep to basically create resources for myself to heal and change. When you first began to pick up the pieces from everything, what were some of the first steps that you took that you found really helpful? Because all of these things led to me making very bad decisions because I didn't know how to say no and I didn't know how to protect myself and honor myself. I first had to get out of an incredibly abusive marriage. And within that, I realized that the only way I could make change was with support. I couldn't do it on my own. Um, I couldn't leave my marriage that was super abusive. I couldn't do that on my own. It was too scary. I needed the support to be able to go back and take the baby steps that I was never able to take in my childhood and in all my formative years. So I started to work with a therapist. I look at, there were angels that came into my life at different times. And one angel came in as this therapist. She totally was out of the box as a therapist and physically helped me find a place, like all these things I didn't know how to do, find a place to live, move all my dogs, basically disconnect financially from my abusive ex-husband, go under the radar for long enough that... I was starting to get some strength. It was baby steps for quite some time after that heart surgery. The heart surgery was the massive wake up. And then it's kind of putting the pieces back together. And because at that point, right around 30, after Saturn return and all, all these monumental moments, and after my trip, my humanitarian trip to Nepal, which was a game changer, I realized that my relationships, the relationships I'd been in, were usually always of this physical nature. And it was all about my power of being able to seduce. My identity and my sense of self-worth was so wrapped up in somebody wanting me in some sexual way. And, um, and I had a huge amount of leverage on that side as being a top model, somebody that, you know, everybody thought they knew how, how it was or how I was or what it was like to look the way that I did. And so I had to do something very radical. And I took a vow of celibacy 
Because the one thing I realized is I had no idea who I was without someone on the other end wanting me. My value and self-worth was so wrapped up in that other identity. I had no idea who I was. So I took a five-year vow of celibacy at 30 and it was the scariest thing. And I also realized there was no relationship I was intimate in, right? It was all faking orgasm and there, there was no relationship I was truly intimate in. It was all performance. And the performance kept me separate from myself. It kept this other identity and ego going so that I didn't have to sit with myself and figure out who I was. That was super vulnerable and scary. So that vow of celibacy and those five years were incredibly telling and painful and scary. And I had to go out and not know who I was, not know how to operate. Really, the friends I had all sort of fell to the wayside because they weren't true aligned friendship. On one hand, it was a really lonely time. On the other hand, it was so empowering and so necessary for me to find out what I liked, you know, what I wanted, what felt good, what didn't feel good, and create a relationship with myself where I had my back. And I became like the sole provider for once I thought was like only somebody else could give it to me. You know, I went from relationship to relationship. This person will be able to give me to myself. It doesn't work like that, you know? And so I became the sole provider for my own happiness and safety and I became my, my best friend and my best date. And it was an incredibly powerful time. And I know that I wouldn't be where I am today without having taken that time and gone through that initiation into my own truth. What gave you that idea to take the vow of celibacy? My spiritual life has been deeply, deeply intertwined in Tibetan Buddhism since I was 17. I have an incredible teacher in Tibet. I've been around monks and nuns. I've seen the value of monastic life. I've seen the value of spiritually ethical lives. I've seen the, the value of prayer and intention. And when I was able to identify that truly the path I was on was one of destruction by my own hand, and go back to the roots of why Tibetan Buddhism resonated with me. And really, for me, it was it's my faith and my connection with the divine, really, that during that period, I was able to identify what I continually kept doing wrong, right? Like this place there, it was just, it wasn't landing. And for me, it was relationship. You know, it was like, wow, I keep doing, what's the definition of insanity, right? You keep doing the same thing and thinking you're going to get a different result. And also I was really realizing energetically, I mean, when we couple with somebody, we are mixing our energy. We are taking on that energy. Now in this divine, amazing marriage, I realized the sacredness of it. And there was no sense of sacred in connection for me. I was not doing it for those reasons. So to identify sort of that piece of my own puzzle that was keeping me from myself and having so much rooted in Tibetan Buddhism and also having Ani's monks and nuns that were part of who I loved and respected. It just seemed like the most obvious step, even though it was so radical and counterculture for a 30 year old supermodel, right? To be like, I'm taking a vow of celibacy. And that was also why a lot of friends dropped away for people in Hollywood. That was absolute insanity because so many people really had decided that they knew me based on my sexuality, that they knew who I was. So what the hell was I doing? And there was all this cultural influence too. Like you're in your childbearing years, you're going to miss the window. And it was like, you know, I fucking have never done anything normally. I've never done it by the books. I've always had a different way, a different way of learning, a different way of doing, a different way of being. So for me, um, it was really clear. And I know it was really clear because it was part of the unfolding of a really profound spiritual shift and spiritual growth and spiritual path. And in that five years, I almost took my robes as a, a Tibetan nun. But my teacher, my lama, being able to foresee what was to come, said, no, no, you have to finish your preliminary practices first, which took about three years. There's all, it's called nundro. It's these foundational practices in Tibetan Buddhism. And they're tough, you know, it's like 100,000 prostrations. It's like a really big 
thing to chew off and people aren't normally moved to do those practices. And so I committed to doing them just to see, you know, okay, I'll make a decision after that, after I complete my Nundra. And, and I know also now why he had me wait, because it would have been easy for me to take my robes as a Tibetan Buddhist nun. What I'm doing now is much harder <laughs> being a mother, you know, and, and a wife and showing up in authenticity and intimacy and having that constantly be like, wow, okay, what does that look like today? So it's definitely sort of my spiritual path to have not taken my robes as a nun and be on the path that I am. I want to talk about faking orgasms. I've been wanting to bring this topic to the show for months, but I've been waiting for the right person because I wanted a personal account rather than a more clinical diagnosis. By now, most people have heard that women fake orgasms all the time. I don't know of a woman who hasn't faked an orgasm, but I don't think people really get to the heart of how big of a problem this is. To be fully transparent, I had only ever reached orgasm on my own until after I turned 30 when I gained the confidence to speak up. A lot of it was about self-worth and not believing I was worth the extra time it took to reach orgasm, not understanding that sex wasn't just about the male ejaculation, and also feeling pressured to fit this character you see in movies or porn or whatever. Why do you think it's so hard for women to give that to ourselves? I have so many thoughts. So it's something that I was pretty bold to write about in in my book that was published by HarperCollins um, in 2011, Beauty Disrupted. And I outed myself because I too think it is such an important topic that's not discussed. And I talk to women of all ages. I mean, from late teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and, and up that have been caught in that web of they've for so long, you know, and there's some women that don't even know if they've had an orgasm. So again, you know, these women have been caught in that web of like, well, I've been faking it for so long and I can do this with myself, but I can't do it with a partner. In terms of sexuality and sensuality, I mean, even in Tibetan Buddhism, if you go back to Tantra, the gateway to the universe is through the feminine. It is where we all come from. It is the divine. It's the vast expanse. It, it is where we're all grown and birthed from. There's something so cosmic and so vast and so profound. It's sacred. And it is of a nature that right now, and you can see we are so far from this connection. And I believe that when there is this alignment and this is a sacred act and we do, or we are loving our bodies, that this all comes together and this, this prana, this energy flows. And I think right now we really are at a time and we might've been for a long time, but there has been this disconnect and disconnect with our appreciation of the sacred feminine and the divinity of this. And we're seeing it as a result and as, as an extension what's going on planetarily, you know, our disconnect with nature right now. And there has been a societal cultural expectation of women where I believe it has not been safe for women to be in that high heart alignment. We're in a time where it's not safe for women to feel vulnerable. It's not cool for women to be feminine, to have periods, to be emotional. We have a pill. So you deal with your emotions. We have a pill so you don't have to get your period. I feel like it's the way that this construct is set up that kind of keeps people, not kind of, it keeps people as prisoners, right? It keeps us in performance mode. And that performance is again, like this further disconnect. So you have a lot of women faking orgasm. Why? It can feel like a death. It can completely rupture your entire psyche and being to be vulnerable, intimate, and have an orgasm. I remember when I first have had my first orgasm with somebody and it was with my current husband. And it was like, I mean, I just cried for like hours. It was the most heart expanding, intense experience to go through because it was true love, love for myself, love for my husband. It was the, you know, the epitome of intimacy. And I look at, you know, well, why hadn't I for so long? 
this concept of performance, I mean, when we're in ego, when we're in fear, we're performing so that people don't truly see our authentic self. And I think the challenge is now is we really are in a time and in a culture that doesn't feel super safe to be these vulnerable, penetrable beings that we are. And physically, we are different than men. We are the ones that are penetrated. So there's a vulnerability just there in our physicality. So meaning that we would need to be within really safe relationship to be able to have that experience. And I also believe that porn culture, you know, a lot of our kids, a lot of our youth has grown up with their first sexual experiences being around pornography, which perpetuates a whole other myth. It's normalizing, again, the same thing with most media, objectification, sexualization, and it's dangerous. And I think that we're all living sort of the result of that until we reclaim it, you know, until we reclaim it. What do you think about it? I have a lot of thoughts about it. I actually have always been pretty vocal. So some people might know me and find it surprising that I did have such a hard time voicing that I wasn't having orgasms. I was really ashamed to say that I couldn't have an orgasm during intercourse, but I didn't really know how to remedy that. And so in a lot of my relationships, I was concerned about not wanting to emasculate him. Uh Uh-huh. Taking care of the other as opposed to yourself. Yeah. I didn't want to be seen in his eyes as the one woman that this man couldn't get off. Uh That's not to say that if I had given some of these guys a chance and told them the truth, that it wouldn't have been different, but I couldn't even do that for myself. Then I would be in a relationship and it would get to a point where I should be comfortable enough to say this, but then I would have to admit that I had lied for this long. Uh Uh-huh. And so it was this whole cycle for me. Oh my God, totally. (laughs) And I was crying about it alone. And finally, I could feel it all coming to a head. And I opened up about it. And ever since, everything is different. And I only wish that I had done it earlier. But now it's something that I talk about. And I bring it up to women. And sometimes my guy friends too. And the more I am open about it, the more women seem to come forward and admit that it's something that they've struggled with also. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's the thing. I'm tired of all these Cosmo articles and advice columns that say that not reaching an orgasm during intercourse is some sort of a dysfunction. The fact is, for women, orgasm comes from the clitoris, and if you're having an orgasm through intercourse, it's likely that your clitoris is low enough that it experiences stimulation from either the base in the inside or during insertion. It's actually abnormal for women to have orgasms during sex. 80% of women cannot have orgasms during sex. So at age 18, 19, hell, 29, when all of my friends were talking about the mind-blowing sex that they're having with their boyfriends without even touching on foreplay, I call bullshit. Most women somehow feel inadequate or that it's their fault if it's not happening. But the moment that we step into our own power, voice what we need, what we want, what makes us feel good, is the moment that we're going to be exuding our radiance. The book I've referred to in the last few episodes, Pussy, A Reclamation, says a turned on woman is a woman in her full honest self. So step up, women. Be honest. And for those lucky minorities that are experiencing super pleasurable sex every single time, more power to you. You won the lottery, so keep doing what you're doing. After my celibacy and when I met my husband, Matthew, I I realized at that point that I would never go back and, and sort of um, create what I had created. And part of that was, you know, a vow to myself that I would never fake orgasm with somebody. And even if it meant I never had an orgasm, like, okay, that's me. I'm never going to have an orgasm with somebody. Even if it meant that, that I was going to absolutely never go down that road because once you start faking it, it's like, oh my God, you've got to uphold it. Right. I mean, it just becomes this whole storyline and you've got to navigate that lie. And so when I met my husband, I was very 
upfront with him about like, look, this is my history. This is how it's been. These are the reasons I think, and I'm not going to do this with you. If we are to have any chance at all, it's that I don't walk into this with any lies or any storyline from my past. And we actually went to a therapist where it was amazing to get support around this. And it was like, okay, just because I'm, I'm fearful of intimacy, I don't want that to be the reason I don't go for this, go for it being with this amazing individual. But that's really where I was. Like I was so terrified of intimacy. I almost backed out of even dating him. And we brought this in and brought it to therapy. And we started out with, he gave us homework, go home and just hold each other. And it was kind of for me reclaiming. It was about not having any expectations. There was nowhere to go and nothing to do. There was no agenda, no storyline. There was no doing. So it was more like how to be, how to just be, be present with what's coming up. This feels good. This doesn't. I'm feeling really frightened now. Like you held me too long. And just to sort of vocalize and be present with all of that. So it was an amazing process that we got support around because I had no idea how to proceed. I had never gone down that path with anybody. I sense a lot of changes coming up with goddess rising and women reclaiming their power, which has already led to the birth of the Me Too movement. But you wrote your book and were pretty vulnerable with your history with sexual assault and faking orgasms even. What was it like to be that vulnerable in a book, especially before the support of the Me Too movement? It was it was really hard. It was it was hard in that I had gotten to a point in my life, I was so sick of perpetuating some myth or sitting on the sidelines looking pretty while there was like all these other stories. And I got to say, being a mom to two daughters, game changer. Like all of a sudden I'm like, hold on. There's a story everybody thinks that they know that continues to like circulate. If my daughters hear a story about me, it's going to be from me. I'm going to tell my story. And so I had to get out and go for it. It did take a lot of courage in that I realized I wasn't going to be popular. I realized that people were going to be triggered, offended, frightened, feel exposed by the things that I was calling out. And you're right. There was very little support. It wasn't like I had a whole sisterhood that stepped in and was like, I went through this too, even though I knew they were out there. So it took courage. Thank God I had the support of my Dharma family, my spiritual family, and my husband who who knew was part of reclaiming myself. And it was part of my healing to step out and sort of whatever that looked like. I had to be willing to take that risk and, and take one for the team of humanity in that women have to tell their stories. It's really important, and it's important for those that come behind me that we've stepped out and we've spoken. But it was interesting. You know, it was interesting going on the book tour, and really the press really wanted to talk about really superficial things. And I was pretty appalled and a little bit depressed that they didn't want to know more about the sexual abuse and sexual assault within the modeling industry. Like, I couldn't have made it more obvious that that was a norm and is a norm within that industry. So it was tough. But I think all of us speaking for the centuries that we have contributes to where we are now and that we continue to speak and support and that, that we'll get there. Not as fast as I would like, but I have an invested interest. I have two daughters and I'll be damned if they have to normalize sexual assault, rape, I will not have them normalize it in any area of their lives. And there's a lot of women who've had to tolerate those abuses in silence. And, and still, globally, it's, it's a big issue. As we've seen, it's within most every industry and every corner of life. I also feel that us in the United States, we have an obligation to those women that do not have the power to speak out, that are being sold as sex slaves, that are being sold as child wives, we have an obligation to speak out. In raising your two daughters, knowing the things that you struggled with, what are some of those things that you do to help them step into their own power 
You touched on teaching body boundaries, but what else is working for you that other parents could maybe implement in their relationships with their daughters? You know, this is interesting. I'm creating, it's called the Blue Lotus Foundation.org. It was a way to address some of the concerns coming out of the community from parents, mothers in particular. And there was a mother who said to me, why do we have to wait until our daughters or our children are symptomatic with anorexia to do something or to have the conversation? So I'm all about prevention through education, dialogue, and awareness. Some of the things that we do here, I mean, we we talk about our own bodies and they have body boundaries for sure. And when something doesn't feel good, whether it's a massage and somebody's massaging you too hard, you get to speak up, whether it's in the dental chair or any place where you feel like you're expected to not speak up. I mean, we saw it with the U.S. Olympic team and this doctor. With parents in the room, these children were being molested. And again, I teach my kids about checking in with their gut. What is their intuition? What do they need to say? Are they speaking up? Also, we talk about food as fuel. Food as fuel, we are what we eat for sure. They'll say to me, oftentimes, mom, am I finished with my meal? And I'm like, check in with your body. Are you full? This whole sort of reward, a discipline with food in the picture, I think it was normalized so much in the 50s. Like if you don't finish your plate of food or, or I'll take you for an ice cream, you got an A. It's a funny thing. And so I feel like in our culture, there's so many different areas that these poor concepts and behaviors are really promoted and pushed. We really have to be diligent as parents that we are engaging in positive, powerful dialogue. I mean, especially in a time where every magazine cover is discussing somebody's physicality or sexual whatever, that we have to find ways to really get into who are we as beings Aside from our physicality, what do we want and what's our worth and our value in who we are as opposed to what we wear, what we look like, what size we are, what gender we are. So I find ways in my own household to really celebrate others. I don't talk about other people's bodies. I don't comment on people's weight, color, shape, size. I really strategically... (laughs) plant seeds. And I also rejoice in in diversity, especially women. So anytime I have the opportunity to speak about somebody's accomplishments, I go for that. I wish I would have been given some of those tools growing up. Most kids aren't taught to listen to their body for guidance at all. So we lose our connection to it and even our love for it. I know how difficult it can be after having an eating disorder, to love your body. Things like sexual assault and eating disorders are just so disconnecting from our own self-love. How did you start to change your relationship with your body and learn to love it? That was such a journey. I had extreme anorexia for over 20 years and as a result had heart surgery. And after that, I began a relationship with food, one that I didn't have before. And it resulted in a huge weight gain because my body had no idea what to do with calories. And that was a normal process that I had to go through. And I look at it now as just like one of the many gifts. I had to learn to love myself at 180 pounds. And, you know, I got to the point of like, Okay, what, what, like, what, what am I going to do? I'm a certain weight and I'm, I'm going to be self-loathing. I mean, I, everything sort of was like thrown at me in terms of, okay, you're going to learn to love yourself in this situation, in this situation, in this situation. I'm doing it now with my silver hair. I'm like, you know, yeah, that's what this life is about is the constant adjustment of expectations and gratitude for ourself and every process that arises. It's that's the spiritual path, right? Part of my recovery was developing a relationship with food, allowing myself to go through the healing process. And part of it too was when I went to Nepal for the first time, there was a different perspective that was given to me. And that was that these people that I was with in Nepal, they couldn't afford the luxury of worrying about their weight. I mean, these women were trying to get meals so they could make enough breast milk to feed their baby. It was just a whole other reality of 
what most of humanity is dealing with and the day-to-day -day practicalities of, of the miracles of our bodies. And so things were really put into perspective. And then also my spiritual path was and is a huge continuum to support recovery. I mean, we can have had eating disorders and we can be recovered. I have a great relationship with food today. And there's certain diligence and maintenance in terms of my spiritual wellness, from meditation to yoga to getting outside. I think if I wasn't diligent with that baseline of, yeah, these things, like without taking a walk in sunshine, yeah, I might feel a depression or whatever that is. So there's a baseline. It's self-care. You know, let's look at it. It's self-care. We all need a practice of self-care because it's, it's about self-love, self-expression. And so that too was not something given to me when I was a kid. And self-care, whether it is your yoga, meditation, walking, preparing food, is a huge part of maintaining recovery. Definitely. What are your favorite self-care methods? Ooh, well, I'm going to be doing a Panchakarma cleanse retreat from Monday through Wednesday, which is the Ayurvedic medical system is just so gorgeous. So I'm really, I love massage. I love putting ghee or butter in my tea, dry brushing, hiking, yoga, meditation, time with my animals, writing, reading, a hot bath with some lavender oil, foot rubs from my husband, you know, just this going and buying flowers at the farmer market and putting them in my home buying a really great scented candle and putting it on and listening to classical music. I mean, I could, I have, I could, I could do, I could do books about self care for me on a daily, making sure I'm doing things that are really good for me. What do you wish someone had told you when you were a young girl? I wish that I had been told that you can say no, that I could say no at any point that I wish that somebody had told me that I was worthy and valuable and that it would all be okay, <laughs> that it would all be okay. Yeah, I think those would have been game changers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. It's interesting because I was told those things growing up for the most part. I had a really good family life growing up, but I still fell into those same patterns of basically giving my power away. Yep. And the more I gave my power away, the less I realized I even had power. Plus, my parents taught me abstinence. And so I think to teach me anything beyond that when it came to my sexuality felt to them as it was going against their religion. Being raised by a religion that teaches that is the only way to salvation or to heaven. That once I started to realize that Christianity wasn't my path or that there are other ways to think about the universe, then all of a sudden, most of the things I had been taught felt as though they were lacking validation or merit completely. But it definitely led to some experimentation and rebellion. Yeah, totally. I mean, the more that we give to our children a continued way to touch in on those really valuable points, we have to be diligent, right? Because it can slip. These ways of being, you know, these empowered ways of being can get slippery if we let go of them. So I'm just all about like, okay, I'm going to hammer it into these kids and then they're going to go have the experience that they have. I'm pretty resigned to that. Like they're going to go have the experience they have, but I think they'll have a better chance in returning home or navigating their way with a really solid foundation. What positive change do you hope to inspire through your legacy? I think that there's a lack of integrity. There's a lot of people out there promoting themselves and really thinking about themselves and what's best for themselves. And I think as a community and as a culture, we really need to realize we are all one. And at the end of the day, what's happening across the planet is going to affect us. What's happening with that sister in New York is going to affect us. We're seeing it with politics right now. What's gotten in the door? So truth, I mean, it's been, it's been a rough point for me and it's made a lot of people uncomfortable, but I am definitely a truth teller and a truth seeker. 
and when things are incongruent, I have a reputation for calling those things out and I have no regrets, but I would hope that I would empower other people to, to follow suit. For listeners that are interested in learning more about you and your advocacy, where can they find you? You can get my book, Beauty Disrupted, to find out more about me. We are just putting the website up right now for the bluelotusfoundation.org, which talks about some of the work and things that I'm doing. I'm also represented by Iconic Focus Models in New York City, and they represent a whole demographic of women in my age range with silver hair that are happily and justly representing a realistic image of what women over 50 look like and do. There is another book in me. There is definitely another book in me. And so that I'm speaking with a couple different agents about that and what that looks like. And I think it's kind of a call in response to advocates and activists for truth and and justice for women's rights, but it's really human rights. I don't limit what I do and educate to just women. We're all in this. Truth and integrity are such beautiful legacies to leave. My goal with this podcast is to be able to open up some of these more difficult discussions and just be honest with each other. So many of us are living these lives where we're trying to be what we think everybody else is or trying to do what we think everybody else is doing. And then when you peel back the veil, we realize we're all suffering from the same things. We're all struggling with the same things. The more we can talk about it, the more we build a new normalcy, the more we step into our own power and the more we feel connected to each other. Don't forget to head to the show notes at mindlove.com slash 025 for the links mentioned in this episode, as well as a link to Carrie's book, Beauty Disrupted. I do want to address that some of you longtime listeners may be noticing that there are ads on the show now. I hope you all are okay with it. These sponsorships allow me to devote more of my time to helping you guys and serving you and They just help me to shine more of the value I feel I was meant to bring to this universe and hopefully shower it on you guys. So thank you for being understanding with that. I promise to only ever promote things that I feel are in line with my values and that I really believe in. That said, other ways you can help support Mind Love is by leaving a review. They really, really help to grow the show and to entice more amazing guests like Carrie Otis to come on and spread their wisdom. If you didn't get the memo earlier, don't forget to sign up for the Morning Mind Love. Thank you to all of you who have already signed up. I'm overwhelmed with the response of how many people are just loving getting these little daily inspirational notes in their emails. Well, that's all today. So thanks for giving your mind a little love today and I'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning into your higher frequency with Mind Love. Head to mindlove.com for a free gift to keep your vibes up until next week. 